and welcome to this special segment of TI Now. We're here with Sandra Rivera. She's the Vice President and General Manager of the Network Platforms Group at Intel. And Sandra, welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I know you have a, you have a busy morning, so we appreciate your time and being here. I want to talk about the open source community for network functions virtualization. I know you're very much behind that. Um, but there's a number of alliances at this point to that effect. There's a number, even many more initiatives behind open source for NFE, and there's a little bit of talk in the industry about the concern about too many outfits working on the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, does that hinder the progress of NFE, in your opinion? Yeah, so how much is too much? Um, well, if you look at the approach to open source, it really is a meritocracy-based approach to code development, and one where it brings together a community of like-minded individuals in terms of solving you know, big uh, industry problems. So. What happens is that you really vote with your feet, right? It, whatever, whatever open source project you're working on, unless you staff it with software developers, it really doesn't progress or go anywhere. So the fact that there are so many open source uh, projects being initiated or at least discussed around the topic of NIV means that there is a great deal of interest, um, that there are still some gaps for us to close in the projects that exist today. And if indeed some of these are filling a need that is currently unmet in those other projects, then you know they, it will get resourced, it will get supported by all of the companies, including Intel, that has a deep commitment to open source and open standards. So, uh, at the end of the day, I don't think it's up to us to decide, you know, what's a good project or what's not a good project. And, uh, and as I said, people will, will vote with their feet and their wallets to, to resource the, the right ones, the ones that have the most impact. We talked to you um, less than two years ago about uh, what open really means for hardware, for software. But I think now it's more of a culture thing where you have to come to the table with an open attitude. Um, in addition to your open hardware and software. Have you seen that evolution over the last couple of years? Well, from an Intel perspective, you know, we have got a deep commitment to open source and open standards. We're the number one contributor to the Linux kernel project. We've been uh, a top contributor to virtualization uh, projects like KVM and Zen. And of course, we've been committed to uh, the XCNFV uh, and OPNFV as founding members, as well as OpenStack, OpenDaylight, um, OpenVSwitch. But, um, but the biggest transformation I think that's happened is the service provider community, the network operators themselves, uh, whether you're looking at you know, a China Mobile or uh, an Orange or a Vodafone or an AT&T, and their willingness to build solutions or source solutions based on open source. So, um, so, yeah, I think that we've seen in the last two years just the, the acceptance of commercial solutions based on open source platforms and ingredients be much more widely accepted. And I really do believe that this will accelerate the transformation of the network that we see happening. Let's talk about another area that may have changed uh, quite a bit over the last couple of years. Again, two years ago, um, there was a lot of talk about the network falling way behind compute and storage as far as virtualization goes. Um, how has that changed um, from really the network being more manual and hardware centric into now being software defined? Well, um, so if you look at kind of the, the, the basic um, resource pools that you need for any, uh, any network application, it's compute network and, and storage, uh, really any data center uh, application. And, um, and it's, it's pretty well known that the network really has become the bottleneck, right? That the advancements in uh, computing and storage technology, not only in terms of performance, but also affordability, has outpaced uh, the, the networking industry and the networking capabilities. We have seen this problem at Intel. In fact, if you dial the clock back uh, 10 years, we started to see the opportunity to take advantage of that server volume economics and that virtualization technology and apply it to this industry. And, um, and in the last five years, we've seen a dramatic increase in, in terms of our ability to address those high performance network workloads with general pro uh, purpose processing compute resources. So if you look at just uh, one metric in packet processing in the last five years, we've increased uh, the packet processing throughput by 25 times. Uh, if we look at the open vSage project uh, with DPDK, the, the data plane development kit, we've uh, increased the performance 12x over vanilla, you know, standard OVS uh, when you use a DPDK optimized OVS. So 
Um, so while we have been the bottleneck, we see uh, a lot of encouraging uh, innovations in terms of just uh, being able to take advantage of Moore's law and apply it to this problem, and then a lot, which allows us then to address this this network and bottleneck issue to increase the rate of innovation in our own industry. So now, two years later, when when we talk about SDN or NFE technologies, um, you soon hear service delivery time, you increase service delivery time, uh, more robust service delivery. Can you give us an example of what that means from your perspective? I'll give you two examples. Um, just this past week, we, we launched a, a, a new product that was specifically designed for uh, networking environments, the Xeon D uh, SOC, which is small uh, but powerful, uh, you know, a low power, uh, small footprint. And uh, Verizon helped us uh, launch that project and or product. And they talked about how in one of their use cases, they've actually seen uh, a reduction in services deployment from something that took many, many weeks down to less than a day. And that's by using these principles of software-defined networking and network functions virtualization and really being able to innovate and offer new services at the speed of software instead of, of you know, having to provision a, a new piece of hardware. at t has also talked about how in their user-defined network, which again applies principles of SDN and FV, they've been able to uh, lower the development the development to deployment time by 95%. So it's really dramatic what you can do in software uh, versus what you can do in hardware. I want to ask you a complete hypothetical question because this is probably not factual really and realistic, but it could happen. Let's say there's a tier one or tier two or tier three carrier that says, you know what, it's too expensive. I'm going to let it kind of flesh out a little bit and see what happens in the industry and then I'll attach myself to the whole virtualization networking craze, right? What would be, and we ask everyone this question, what would be like a doomsday scenario for that carrier? Well, uh, increasingly we know that the, the service providers want to move beyond just being that you know, fat dump pipe or they want to keep from becoming that fat dump uh, pipe. And unless you're able to take advantage of you know, the, the server volume economics, the rate of innovation in terms of all things virtualization and, and cloud, you really start to fall behind in meeting your end user requirements, um, whether that's a consumer or an enterprise. So um, I don't know how viable companies that aren't going to embrace an architectural approach that allows them to innovate really as fast or faster than the cloud pace because someone will fill that gap in the market. Someone will fill that need in the market. So um, there aren't any conversations that we're having with tier one, tier two, or tier threes that aren't about transformation of their networks to take advantage of, of again, the economics and the innovation curve uh, that we see coming from cloud and coming from uh, data center and enterprise. Um, so I don't really see that scenario playing out, but, um, but it, it wouldn't be good. So again, a couple years back, we were talking about the hype around network virtualization, SDN, really now talking more about NFV, really. Um, now we're talking about real use cases, real test beds, NFV labs. You're right in the middle of all this. How far have we come? And can you give me an example of a test bed or, or a lab that's actually produced a solution regarding NFV? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've invested quite a bit in, um, in our own labs. It, uh, which we build uh, for our Intel Network Builders community, our, our community of developers that are committed to NFV and SDN solutions. We have uh, la joint labs with service providers and with many of our um, our own cus direct customers, the solutions providers. And of course, we do host one of the OPNFV uh, labs. Uh, where I would say most of the innovation is happening and, and most of the first uh, installations of commercial deployments are happening is uh, in the network edge and virtual EPC, virtual CPE uh, solutions, both for uh, enterprise as well as for consumers. Telefonica is deploying now in Brazil their virtual CPE solution for uh, consumers. And um, the other big pocket of activity is virtual EPC in, in the core of the network. And we see, as an example, uh, Samsung has rolled out a service uh, using virtual EPC technology for public safety. So really the coordination of uh, their firefighters, their um, uh, police officers, and you know, medical teams that can be t deployed quickly and using an infrastructure that, again, is highly programmable to bring new services and applications and capabilities uh, to the network much, much more quickly. 
We've had a few conversations over the last day or two about um, concerns around security and IoT, but also in NFE as well. Uh, at a high level, um, what, what jumps out at you right away as far as security and NFE? So, you know, security is a huge concern. We heard it here earlier in, in the programming uh, that we've got at the OPNV Summit. Um, because when you look at you know, cloudification of the network, you have a much more distributed and a much more intelligent uh, network, but you also open yourself to many more points of, of attack. So, so clearly this is on the mind of all of the communication service providers globally, um, but this is also a problem that the cloud service providers have, have dealt with and that we at Intel have addressed through hardware and software innovations. Uh, we have a capability in our silicon called trusted execution technology, which really gives you an ability to do a secure boot uh, in your platform and build trusted compute pools so that you know that that hardware that you're deploying uh, and uh, upon which you're running applications. You can attest to the integrity of the hardware and even using geotagging the physical location because some applications really can't move outside of a specific geography due to you know, government uh, regulations or requirements. We also have you know, software-based innovations. Our AES uh, native instructions allow you to do cryptography. Um, our quick assist technology allow you to do compression uh, and uh, acceleration capabilities as well. And all of these really address a lot of those security concerns. Again, underlying ingredient hardware and software technology, but exposing it up to the application through the orchestration level so that they can make good use of, of those innovations. So what would you say if um, an industry stakeholder said, look, security is going to, security needs to lie at the edge in the cloud and on the network, the data center. But ultimately the network service providers will be blamed for a security breach no matter what. So do you feel like it's best to make the network as robust as possible from a security standpoint um, given that, that perception by the industry? Well, you know, there, there is no, um there's no kitchen pass, if you will, for a network operator. They still need to deliver high levels of reliability, high levels of security, regardless of how their infrastructure is architected and deployed. So uh, our job is to provide the industry and the solution providers with the very best ingredient technology um, to engage with the end customers of service providers so we understand how to characterize and optimize uh, those technologies to the use cases that they care about and to work as a collective community to ensure that those reliability and security concerns exist throughout the network. And, and having a programmable, uh, intelligent network that's built using all of these innovations with underlying server technology really do enable that to that vision to come to reality in terms of, hey, um, I am still going to need to address reliability and security concerns, but I'm just going to do it in a different way than I have uh, historically. So, of course, NFE technologies have been applied to various verticals. Again, Intel is very much involved in that, transportation, retail, health IT. What's the most challenging vertical, though, where NFE needs to be applied to? From a vertical perspective, if you look at what's happening with the Internet of Things, um, it is so fragmented, right? You have many, many different verticals that are coming to market and need high performance networks to enable the, the types of user experiences and the low latency, particularly at the uh, access, uh, in the access network and at the edge of the network that is required. We focus our innovations for IoT in four verticals that we think have the biggest impact in the near term. Uh, automotive, healthcare, retail, and industrial automation. And, uh, and these industries all require high performance, low latency capabilities at the access edge and the network edge. And um, it requires an ability to move massive amounts of data to the user and do real time processing, again, in that access and, and network edge. So, uh, so those are quite challenging, but as we address the challenges and the requirements of those verticals, we believe that we have an opportunity to address the you know, many of the other verticals that will come online and be critical in the IoT era. So one more question, in the NFE space, and I know that you have um, covered a lot of topics even here at the OP NFE conference, what do people like me don't not, not ask about NFE? What should we be t asking you and talking about? One of the things that I think um, we probably don't spend enough time uh, focusing on yet, but we're starting to, is the 
business process re-engineering that needs to happen within the service provider network or within the service provider enterprise itself. The retooling uh, of the, the people, if you will, and the skill sets when you move from a network architecture that has been largely hardware-based to one that's software-centric. Those are very real, um, challenging, cultural, uh, human problems, and and I think collectively as an industry we do need to address them because it becomes much more of a business problem than a technology uh, problem. I think the technology uh, questions will answer. Uh, lots of smart pe you know people, lots of smart engineers working on that. But some of these kind of softer issues around operations and and skill sets um, and impact on on people and, and jobs, you know, those are, are just as critical and maybe even a bit tougher. Well, maybe the next time we talk, we'll, uh, we'll focus on that as well. Um, Sandra, as always, it's great to have you, and um, thanks for your time. Great seeing you, Abe. You too.